When I met you last year, you had just come back from your trip to Ukraine. <sighs> that was a tough trip, definitely. You literally chronicle every moment of your life through the content that you share and create. And there's such a distinct difference from one video is like, hey, went on a date with a girl at a rave for the first time <laughs> to six months later, your video is, we survived an explosion in Ukraine. And the first question I have is, what changed? You know, it's like weird. Like I'm in therapy now, so I'm like worked through this for a long time now. Um, I think when I started making videos, I just wanted to simply make videos. Like I didn't know exactly what this purpose was. I just thought that the lifestyle was cool. I could do whatever I want, make videos about anything I want. I was kind of feeling lost. And I think that the only thing that was relatable about my life at the time was romance. Like everyone, no matter where you are in the world, you can connect with love. So that's the videos I wanted to make was like, I kind of didn't have as much love life going on. Like, you know, I grew up in an area where I was the only one that looked like me. So I wanted to make videos of, you know, as an Asian American kind of navigating through romance. But over time, I think you kind of get over it in the sense, not like getting over love, but mm. if you are making videos, the same type of videos for years and years and years, it just gets a little bit stale. And I kind of wanted to understand like what my purpose in life was. I remember you mentioned in your video when you met with Justin Khan, the co-founder of Twitch, that's when you were thinking about going to Ukraine. Yes. And he told you, you know, the hardest choices often have a lot of resistance. You mentioned your parents were war refugees. Why go and revisit that trauma? Like, use a world where you could continue to make con around the good parts of the human existence, around love and happiness and relationships. Why decide to go into an active war zone and focus on that? I think at the time, I was kind of... I didn't know what it would be like. So to me, it just thought like, oh, people are suffering. I'll go help. And I'm going to be very honest. Like when it comes to volunteering in Ukraine, like I never wanted to go into actual Ukraine. Like I was just at the border driving people to and from, you know, the border to their new homes in Poland or like, you know, picking up resources. And what ended up happening was you just stay there longer and longer and longer. And you start to realize like, oh, wait, people need more and more help. And I think one of my biggest problems is I'm not very good at saying no. So when people ask me, I'm like, sure, why not? And so someone asked me like, hey, we need someone to go into Lviv, which is the Western part of Ukraine. I was like, okay, this is, I've been here long enough. I think it's quite safe. Mm. I'll make the decision to go in. And then two weeks later, someone was like, we need someone to go to Kiev. And so that's how I made my way to Kiev. And then I think a month later, someone asked me to go to Kharkiv, which is like, I think 50 miles from the Russian border. And I still said yes, even though I felt like it was kind of extremely dangerous. At the time, though, how do you say no to people that need help? I still am like figuring that out in my life. Even to this point, I'm trying to figure out like, where do I give and when do I look after myself? So I, I'm still growing. You know, I'm still learning that. What changed around when I met you last year? Therapy was something you had like been grappling <sighs> a lot with around doing, what changed? What got you to that place? Um, well, therapy for me was always, it's looked down upon in our culture. Yeah. And I think the biggest part for me was it's financial. I mean, to be honest, like you know quite well about my financial situation. Like it's you, really- You were homeless. Yeah. <laughs> and I was just talking to my therapist about this because she asked me like why I feel so much animosity between uh, being back in my home. Cause like I'm visiting my mom right now. And I was telling her, like, even when I'd come home when I was 16, I would sleep in my car instead because I knew that I wasn't really wanted at my own home. So in a lot of ways, she was saying, you've been in, like, home scarcity since you were 16, over 10 years now. And I kind of really start to feel that, like, everyone's like, you're traveling the world and doing all these cool things. But it really feels like this entire journey of traveling the world is just to figure out a place that is home for me. You yeah. said that even when you were 16, you didn't feel welcome at home. What do you mean by that? So I grew up in an area called Santa Ana, and it's in Orange County. Um, and most of my friends were POC growing up. Um, not many Asian people, but you know, people I still connected with really well. Uh, then I moved to an area called Newport when I was 14. And most people there are like very wealthy white people. 
Uh, everyone there owns boats. That's like a very Newport thing. I couldn't connect with people very easily. Mm. I looked very different. I had different interests. This sounds ridiculous, but I got into drugs at a very young age. Um, nothing crazy, but like I, I, th I remember using a little bit too much Xanax when I was like 15. Yeah. And I, uh, I ended up passing out in school. And that was kind of a big wake up call for me, realizing like, oh, this is like maybe not the right decision. But the reason being why I struggled so much in my home life is I was, you know, using a lot of drugs and I was, you know, didn't feel like I fit into this like typical Asian stereotype. Yeah. So that just created a rift between me and my mom. I ran away. My dad called the cops on me, got put in the back of a cop car in front of you know, everyone at my, at my school. And I think at that point I kind of realized, Ooh, I don't know if I fit in here. And whenever I come home at night, I would prefer to sleep in my car because I don't want to, you know, upset my mom at the time. You mentioned your parents were war refugees. And when I think back to like, I haven't talked much to my parents. I saw my mom recently. That was the first time in three, four years. Wow. And it's because I think that their priority wasn't necessarily on, oh, self-fulfillment and the upper levels of Maslow's hierarchy. It was like, oh, let me just survive. I'm curious, like, what was that like with your parents? Like to come from a place where it's literally like, I need to live. And now you're growing up and they're your mom and your dad. And you're not growing up in a situation of war, but you're being raised by people who have been through that. Sometimes in the Asian community, well, go around asking people, what is the most toxic Asian person? And the majority of the time, the answer is always Vietnamese people. And I think it's because one, there's an abundance of Vietnamese people in America. But mm. also number two, we're not that far removed from a, war, from a war. Like our parents' generation experienced that. For me growing up, I couldn't really understand why they felt like we, ha we had such an insane scarcity mindset. Like every single part of my life, no matter how successful my parents got, they always felt like it could disappear like that. Almost yeah. like everything that happened to them in Vietnam, like the government just took everything away from them. So my mom and my dad had, even as though they're both war refugees, they escaped from different routes. Like my dad flew over while my mom escaped on a little boat for four months going up the coast of China. And she ended up in Macau and then ended up in a refugee camp in Hong Kong for four years. And so the things that she went through in this camp, like she never wanted to tell me because it was just unimaginable to her. Um, she ended up learning Cantonese and she would sneak out of the camp every day to try to work and get some money. But it's like so, it's, it was basically a prison. But the cool thing is like more recently, you know, me and my mom were able to fix our relationship and uh, me and my assistant and I, we got to go to Hong Kong and visit her first refugee camp. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was like such an emotional experience to know that like me and my mom have been through so much where we weren't talking for like three years. And then we finally came back together. We like try to be best friends now. And I got to see like, oh, this is the history of your life. Who reached out first to repair that relationship? It's a mixture of both. I think I started reaching out first because I had gone to UCLA. And yeah. that was such a big thing because growing up, I was always like the really bad student. I actually applied to like 12 universities and didn't get into a single one. Um, so <laughs> I ended up in community college. And the reason why I you know, made the shift to caring about school more was my dad got sick. And he was like, hey, if you could have any dream or if I could have any dream in the world, I would love for you to go to university. Mm. So I got into my dream school and that's when my relationship with my mom started to repair. It wasn't even about like, I think maybe her being as proud of me going to UCLA, but almost more like she felt like I could be a part of this like world that she built for herself. Like, you know, feeling proud of all these things. So like, I always say that me and my accomplishments are just bragging rights for my mom. Right. In a way to help her fit into a world that goes by such a different set of roles than what she was used to. Now she can be like my son, Philip got into UCLA. Yeah. So that was kind of how our relationship repair started. And yeah. then she actually got married, remarried. Um, fortunately, my dad passed when I was 18. So she got remarried. I came to the wedding. And this was after I'd been to Vietnam. So I kind of understood the history of her people more often or more. And that's kind of started to how our relationship repaired. And when you came back to visit her, you also got a corporate job too. I had gone to UCLA. 
I feel like if you go to UCLA, it is very typical for you to kind of just get a corporate job afterwards. Like it felt like UCLA was like one of the biggest killers of creativity almost. Wow. Like, oh God, I love UCLA, by the way. Like I loved my experience there, but it really felt like if you weren't following the herd and you weren't doing everything else, you would kind of just be left behind. And I feel the same thing. You went to Harvard, right? Oh, so. 100%. Everyone ends up in finance or consulting or tech. So that's how I ended up in finance. It wasn't as much for my mom. It's just more like everyone else was doing it. So I thought this is what happiness is like. And then why did you quit though? This might be controversial, but I kind of felt like I was making rich people richer and poor people poorer. Mm. <laughs> um, and I'm not saying that that's all of corporate America, but it felt like my job in finance, it really kind of felt like the companies that we were, you know, helping merge sometimes they, or helping buy sometimes, it would felt like some of these companies were using like unethical tactics to get ahead. Yeah. And you can, I guess, make an argument that to get ahead in life, you always have to be unethical maybe. So you quit your job and to honor your dad's dream, decided to travel and live a life at adventure instead. I guess I should mention this. My dad is my biggest hero in life. And so when he passed away, like that just destroyed my entire reality because I saw my dad as Superman. Quite literally, I feel like every Asian parent wants their kids to like get, go to a good school and get an amazing job. But my dad was more along the lines of just get an education and then chase whatever you want to chase. Like money shouldn't be that big of an issue um, because he had all his money ripped from him in Vietnam. So he really felt like your life is, you know, you have one life. If you're not going to go live it, then, you know, it'll pass you by. So I decided to leave my career and move into my car to make TikToks, which I know sounds insane. I had no following, but it kind of worked out well, at least for now. <laughs> I almost see that as like two different reactions that come from the same root cause where your parents grew up in really difficult circumstances. And I think one way you react to scarcity is, gosh, that's exactly why you have to get those conventional trappings of success. That's why, hey, you need to go get a degree from school and a secure yeah. and stable job. And I think another reaction coming from the same place is like, yeah, holy shit, life can just be so terrible and variable and random that just try and be happy. I think that's where I'm at right now is I'm trying to learn to be happy again after all these like tragedies after, you know, going to Ukraine is I feel like the world is always going to be at war with each with itself. Um, so for me, just figure out when I can help and when I need time for myself. When I followed your journey through the content you had made, through deciding, let me honor my dad's wish and let me live this life adventure, I felt like I noticed this big difference before and after Ukraine. I, ca I categorize my life as before Ukraine and after Ukraine. So... It's like a really big life event for me. I remember you told me last year when an explosion happened within sight of you that like you thought you were going to die. Yes. Oh. What was going through your mind in that moment? I think that's what made me kind of understand my family a lot more because my mom would tell me stories of her being a war refugee and, you know, like watching like other boats get gunned down. And I think sometimes you just ex expect that the explosion is everything, but leading up to it, like worrying about your safety, I think the most worrisome thing for me about almost dying is everything leading up to it and the fear that you go through and the panic that you go through from like just potentially it happening. And that I think was honestly more terrifying to me because I started calling all my friends and family yeah. um, and everyone was asleep because this was like the middle of the day in Ukraine. So I couldn't contact anybody. And so I'm calling my friends in Poland saying, hey, like it's raining down on us really hard right now. Um, explosions are happening and we can hear them. If anything happens to me, please contact these numbers. And so I gave them like a, a quick list of like, this is my mom, this is my brother, and this is, you know, my ex. <laughs> uh, I don't know why I gave my ex at the time, maybe because... You know, it's the last person I loved, but I really wanted my loved ones to know that I died doing something that I really cared about. 
And I also wanted to make sure that if I did die, they knew that, you know, my last thoughts were just how much I love them. And, you know, I'm proud for them to just stick by me. Yeah. Because going to some place that's like really scary that you will potentially die, it's, I think the most worrisome for me was worrying about how other people will be like when I, when I disappear. You know, I love my family so much, which is so odd because I couldn't care le- I couldn't care less about them when I was younger. But as I've gotten older, I realized that they're the ones that have stuck by me this entire time. Making friends is really hard. Like you live in Los Angeles and it feels like sometimes people just value you for, you know, numbers or money or what you can do for them. Yeah. And as I've been able to take a lot of time away from LA and New York, I've kind of just started to realize, wow, the people that really stuck with me happen to be my family. I mean, what you said, just, I think the point on relationships, it's like you're describing the people in your life. You, you care about them. You love them so much. Like how you even end up in Ukraine in the first place was because you met people there that you cared about and they needed help. And so you stepped in to help them. I know that there are so many people in your life that have needed help and you've been there for them that the last thing you're thinking about when you're literally worried what's going to happen to you is just, gosh, I hope the people who care about me are going to be okay. I I guess maybe it's not that I don't value my life, but I always have this mentality of like how other people are going to perceive this. Yeah. Which is kind of a dangerous game when you do social media (laughs) because your inherent value is rooted in, oh, what are you posting online? And, you know, your inherent value is how do other people feel about this type of content that you're putting out there? So I think I've been really lucky because I joined social media a little bit later than most people. Mm -hmm. Like I started when I was 24. I am now 27. Um, And because I joined later, it was easier for me to process that, hey, like, not everyone feels this way about these hate comments. And to be honest, for the most part, I let hate comments just like bounce right off me. Hmm. Um, but I'll always read them and kind of self-reflect and feel like, does this have some for, sort of validity to it? And I will say that the one comment that always got to me that made me feel like horrible was, it's tough to see a POC decide to go to Ukraine and support their cause when there's tons of other places around the world that are also POC that feel like they're kind of being overlooked. And I think being Asian in America, one of the biggest problems is sometimes we feel invisible. So that really kind of hit me. And I think people don't know the backstory. Like I've been to Ukraine before this war started. I spent so much time with the people. They shared so much love for me. And I felt a lot more comfortable going to a war zone where I kind of knew the layout of the country already. But any other places in the world... I hadn't, I hadn't been there, so it didn't feel as safe for me to go to these places. But it's crazy in a way you're being asked to justify, like, hey, I care about the people here and I want to help. And people are saying, but there are so many more people that need help. You are literally living your life around trying to think how to help people. I think that's the part that kind of sucks is the more and more you try to give, the more people can scrutinize, like, why aren't you doing even more? While other creators, I don't want to bash any other creators, but I think that the level of expectation for a creator that is trying to do something really special, that or is very personal to me at least, I feel like I get a lot more, like, you know, people have higher expectations. Yeah. Um, but that's okay because, you know, I want to try to meet some of them. I don't know, therapy's been a little bit, interesting where I'm now setting up my own goals and you know I try not to care as much about what other people you know put for me and be like this is this is what I want to accomplish as long as I'm able to do those things I feel happy with my accomplishments before therapy did you care more about what others thought I think it's gonna be like a little bit of a roller coaster like honestly the happiest moments in my life is when I didn't care about how other people Mm. perceive me at all I would just travel the world, be broke, like partying and drinking all the time. And then as I started to do social media and gain more of an audience, 
it felt like a lot more pressure and it felt like, oh, I should be doing something good with my platform because everyone else is talking about how influencers should do something positive. But I am not an activist at heart. I'm a, I try my I try my best to be, but I'm not like a political speaker or anything. I, yeah. I'm not media trained at all. So I'm trying my best to navigate this landscape, putting out things that I believe are right. And sometimes I'm going to falter. So all that I can do best is maybe talk less about, you know, how I view things and more just giving action and trying to do things. It's like this is my experience this is what I'm going through. I remember there's a clip of you in Ukraine where you're recording and you say like, I feel so stupid even recording this right now, but I need to because that's the only way I can let people know what's happening. Oh man, recording things while you're under trauma is such a weird like experience because on one side, I don't want to record anything. Yeah. Like, but on the other side, I know like, oh, like if I don't record this, then that's not like, how can I do more help? You know, like if I'm not able to make money to, you know, support myself, I can't make more videos. And I, I mean, I was just actively losing money the entire time. Like I'm just spending my own money, like, you know, to make videos about Ukraine to try to fundraise even more money. I want to say that Mission Ukraine, Mark and Dylan, like the guys that run that, they deserve you know, the majority of the credit, they did an amazing thing. But like together we were able to fundraise like over half a million dollars total. Mm. Um, and you know, I played a small part of that, but if I can't make those videos and I don't record in that moment, then like, how are we supposed to raise money? You know, how am I supposed to contribute to raising money? It's like this weird thing. It's like your value is I need to make this video. So people hear and learn about this, but that also intrudes on you going through your own private experiences and trauma. It's almost like everything, I need to record this so other people can see because that's how I help. And even the messaging of the video is so odd because one thing I noticed early on was we would make two different types of videos about Ukraine. Um, one of the videos was, you know, mostly about like kind of informative slash maybe a little bit more sad, you know, telling other people's stories. And obviously like if you're telling other people's stories going through a war zone, like, you know, you're going to pick sad music. You're yeah. going to try to do something that's appropriate and, you know, try to raise that money. Um, but then we found the videos that actually were extremely successful were the ones where I was just kind of vlogging like a day in the life of like, this is what life is like. And maybe not trying to, you know, create like this overarching victim type of video. Mm. Phil, this is the most surreal conversation I have with a creator. Usually when creators are talking about like CTR conversion, it's like, oh yeah, because I need to get more views. And for you, it's, you're literally like, I need to raise money for people in a war zone. I, I think one thing that kind of sucked to me was realizing that it's not just about helping. It's a lot of like bureaucratic red tape yeah. when you're volunteering. Like, you know, sometimes I feel like huge nonprofits, they aren't able to send their people to like really important spots because the spots are too dangerous. And yeah. so what they do is they basically network with grassroots orgs or smaller orgs that, you know, don't have that so much like rules and regulations and they can send it to them, send the profits, send the resources to them, and then they'll go out and do it. But there is some like political game of, Hey, if I'm working with you, I need, you know, a kickback in the sense of, I need you to do this for me. It's like money flows to where attention is. You were going out and getting attention in a way the focus of your content changed and evolved as we talked about before from, Hey, I'm living a life of adventure to, I need to raise awareness for others. What now was the focus after Ukraine, especially what I'm hearing you describe, it sounds like a lot of therapy in some ways is saying like, Philip, it's okay to care about yourself. I think, you know, as we've kind of had this conversation, I'm proud that I've been talking about my feelings and needs because maybe Every other conversation about Ukraine I've had has always been about like, I feel like I could have done more for these people. Like these, the people that I met in Ukraine, like my goodness, they're some of the most, the strongest, most enlightened people I've ever met that really just want to do their best to survive. That's yeah. simply it. They're, these people are just trying to survive. And it's weird for me to get all this credit because like I'm making these videos and we're like, you know, a lot, like millions of people are seeing these videos, but I'm just a small piece in this cog, you know, yeah. and I really want to make sure that everyone knows that I am a very small part of volunteering. And there are so many people on these huge teams that make this happen. 
and there's a lot more people that are making real systematic change in some of the, some activist instances, people making huge change that get no credit because, you know, they're not, you know, a social media personality. So that kind of gave me a lot of heavy imposter syndrome where people are like, oh, this guy is like making such a big difference in the world when I'm just, you know, I am trying my best to make a difference, but everyone else that volunteers or in Ukraine, those are the people that like, you know, are all actively coming together to make changes in people's lives. I've actually noticed that recurring theme in some of your past content as well, where you talk about, you know, your friend Luke who was going through cancer. There was oh. a period of time where you needed as a human being to take care of yourself and live your own yeah. life, which he wanted you to do. And from what I saw, like was the weirdest thing ever for you to be like, oh, maybe I should go and live my own experience. This is something that I'm still trying to work with or trying to rationalize in my brain. Yeah. Because I guess the story is um, this guy from my high school ended up getting cancer and it's been tough. His mom had cancer. She passed away from cancer. His dad also had cancer and his dad also was um, in a fire. So like a lot of yeah. his face had been, a lot of his body had been charred off um, and they had lots of reconstruction surgeries to help him out. And Luke is like the most amazing guy ever. So I got to, you know, I saw his GoFundMe and I simply just wanted to raise money for him. Honestly, I really thought I'd make a video promoting his GoFundMe, tell a story and then I'd dip and work on, you know, things that I really, other things that I really want to work on. Um, but we just got along so well. Like we're just, I remember the first day I got there, we were like cracking jokes about like, you know, our travels. He's also traveled a little bit, talking about girls, talking about, you know, our high school experience. And I decided, oh, I'm just going to come like take care of this guy for three months. Um, and I was living in my car at the time. So like for me, I was like, oh, I get a couch to sleep on now, you know, win, win. And so I'm like driving him to his doctor's appointments back and forth, his chemo treatments. And we gave, you know, all of us pitched in a little bit of money um, to basically redo his entire living room. On the outside, I think people see it as like, wow, like, you know, look at all these amazing things you're able to do. But on the other side, it's like, hey, you know, you're benefiting from, benefiting from this. This is like social media and you're gaining a following from this. Right, you're making content. And I think that those two things, like, don't have to be so mutually exclusive. Like, you can enjoy what you're doing and still be selfless. Um, I guess maybe that's inherently selfish in itself, but I guess the idea, like, it's not mutually exclusive to to do things that are good for other people and also benefit for yourself. Yeah, I don't think it's selfish to help people and also feel good while doing it because the alternative is so I have to help people and feel miserable. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm going to be honest, like, I love doing, like, helping out people because it makes me feel good about myself. It makes me feel like I'm a better person. <laughs> Going back to the point of him kind of like me trying to realize that I can't take care of this guy forever. Um, and he didn't expect me to, but I had it in my brain. Yeah. Like, how can I complain about this situation of helping you out when you're the one suffering with cancer, you know? And internally I was kind of dying. Um, not taking care of him, but just being back in my hometown where I didn't have the best experience. So I didn't know how to voice that opinion. Um, what ended up happening was COVID kind of came back. And so I couldn't even see him anymore because he's immunocompromised. So I went to go travel. Then I ended up in Ukraine and I came back almost a year later to spend time with him. And um, I was really happy to know that, you know, we still saw each other as best friends. I, mean, I, I call this guy like once every two weeks, every week. And yeah. then towards uh, the end of his life, I probably talked to him twice a week. So that's actually why I'm back, unfortunately. Um, he passed away this past month. Sorry to hear that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very sad, obviously, but I'm, this is one of the few times where I really feel like I'm happy he gets to rest finally. Yeah. I, I've lost a lot of people in my life, but this man was just, he had to go through so much, like so much pain. He would call me all the time, like almost loopy because he took so many, so many medications it almost feels like I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Like it sounds so weird to say that like I'm happy that, you know, my best friend passed away, but more like, I'm just happy that he doesn't have to go through that pain anymore. Yeah. You know? Like he's too young. You carry a lot of emotional vulnerability with you where people share 
what they're going through with you too. I know not just Luke, but many of your other friends, even your mom, I know as your relationships improved, she started to open up to you as well. What in therapy are your expectations for yourself? Not not for helping others, but mm. for yourself. I think my life is a little bit odd in this idea that for the most like traditional forms of success, I don't really f- value them. Like I don't really make that much money from social media. Um, I just ha- make enough for us to barely get yeah, by. You literally turned down thousands in brand deals. Yeah. <laughs> while while like you've not had a single steady place to live for how many years now? I would say four, but my my therapist said like ten. Why does she say ten and you say four? Because for me, like it didn't start when I it started when I started traveling. Yeah. But uh, for her, she's like. You know, your time in university, you weren't even living at your apartment. It was like a nine month lease. I was probably gone for two of those months. So like I was, it was just like me living in an apartment, like on and off for seven months, like coming there, traveling, coming back, which I know is not, you should go to school kids. Yeah. Like even when you were in school, you're just like, I just have to get out of here. Yeah. I, I really hope that I find a place where I feel comfortable one day. Yeah. Um, and you know, the craziest thing about therapy was a year ago, my therapist told me, I would like for you to be somewhere for an entire month. And that just scared the crap out of me because I was like, what if I don't like it? You know, what if one place for one month, like in a new country, in a new city, that just scared me so much. And looking back, that just sounds so ridiculous of a sentiment to have. Like living somewhere for one month is terrifying to me. And now the the goal is three months, you know, um, to live somewhere. And maybe past that six months, maybe a year, I, I would love that. I think it's really interesting because these numbers on social media, they like grow so fast. And for me, I've missed out on so many life events in the sense of, you know, I didn't get to really celebrate myself hitting a mill. I was freaking traveling uh, two mill. I on TikTok, I like I was in Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't get to celebrate these type of like typical creator successes. And then and things to just celebrate yourself. Yeah. Never myself. But that's why like, you know, me moving somewhere and me finally like signing a 12 month lease anywhere. That is like such a big moment for me. Um, and you know, I've gone to the point where I actually can afford that. Like I could afford to maybe not in LA or New York, but I could afford to sign a 12 month lease anywhere in Asia, right? Most places in Asia right now. So I think that might be next is if I ever feel comfortable, I would, if I ever sign a 12 month lease, anywhere, I would probably just sit in my empty apartment and just cry tears of joy because to me, that's like what making it is like, is to know that I have, you know, a place that I can just call home, I can come back to and that I can just finally relax. What was so terrifying about the concept of just staying in one place for one month? You know, one thing you learn about in therapy is it all dates back to your childhood. Yeah. And for me, you know, this idea of just not feeling wanted anywhere, not feeling valued. If I started to feel that, I would kind of just push people away. You're just getting a little bit too close to people, you just fear not being valued, you know? So like the closer I get to people, the more I think to myself like, well, this person is going to get sick of me eventually. And well, why not just, I'll just make the decision beforehand. It's like end it when things are good. Exactly. So that's my biggest thing was like, I would always leave when things are on a high note. So they have this good memory of me because over time I have this idea that everyone's going to get sick of me. Maybe if you leave at the right time, they'll miss you. A lot of what I've seen in your videos, you've so many friends and relationships you've built in so many places, often off a chance meeting, but then you leave them and then sometimes you come back. I think it's almost like you're giving yourself scarcity in your friends' lives. Like, yeah. because I'm not back very often, everyone will go out of their way to spend time yeah, with Yeah, it me. feels special. Like, I was very genuine when I said it feels special to be like, oh, gosh, like, Philip is in town. <laughs> and I can totally see if you grow up feeling not wanted, there's this, like, terrifying fear. Oh, my gosh, if I just stick around... If it's not special for me to be here, is it still special to see me? Definitely. That is something I'm trying to work towards. Uh, you know, the idea that people don't just value me because I'm scarce, but more like they just really enjoy me. Yeah. 
but I don't know. I feel like everyone's in my childhood, people would just get sick of me and I don't really get sick of people either. So, so it's always, they're the ones who are getting tired of you and your perception. You still want to see them. I think that's the thing is why I've been able to keep my closest friends is I make a lot of effort for my friends. Oh yeah. Um, like I'll fly back. I call them like every two weeks. Like I really try my best and honestly they're busy, which is like so odd because I'm the one like traveling the world, but I take a lot of time off from posting right now. It feels like for the first time I don't have to like, you know, join this machine of just churning out content. Like I don't, I spend no money. I don't need much money to live so I can kind of just decide when I want to post. Yeah. There's so much more freedom. That's the coolest thing is like YouTube, like this YouTube kind of blew up for me this year yeah. and I make enough money from YouTube to just not take any brand deals for the most part. And so that's like been really exciting. So I haven't taken any brand deals at all this year. I will be taking my first brand deal, like literally after this trip. <laughs> you mentioned in some ways your parents grew up in a mindset of scarcity that you yourself also felt emotional scarcity in terms of people wanting you. And Ooh, I did not think about that. <laughs> like in some ways it very naturally led to you like growing up, the type of love you would receive is so potentially fleeting that it's something in a way you've continued to build, but on your own terms, it's like it's scarce, but because you're always traveling, you've shared with me a lot around previous like financial scarcity, you know, as we said, you lived out of your car. Like a lot of times you would stay over at friends or like relationships with women that you would meet. <laughs> yeah. Like, like actually that's a real thing. Like you, you need a place to stay. I, I saw this podcast you did with this, um, this star. Kazumi. Yeah. Kazumi. And I saw that she talked about how she would always try to move in as quick as possible with her boyfriends and it ended up horrible. In yeah. a lot of ways, like I would kind of do that while traveling was like when I didn't have any money and I wasn't making any videos, I would like meet these girls and like try to move in because I didn't have anywhere to stay. Yeah. And it, it never ended well, but it never ended well. Not because like, you know, thing we hated each other. It was actually more because I just left and went to the next place. Yeah. And that was mostly because I didn't want them to grow sick of me. Some girl asked me the other day, what would you do if money wasn't an issue and you know, you could be anywhere in the world. And I told her like, it was kind of cheesy and romantic, but I was like, I would be right here Aww. right now. Uh, but it wasn't even just about her, but I, I chose to be there because yeah. I don't use that much money and I can kind of make videos about anything I do. So like, if I want to make videos about helping people, I can do that. If I want to make videos about just me vlogging, I feel yeah. like that's interesting to people. Like, what changes now that you feel even more freedom in terms of things you could do. Which is weird because I am planning on expanding the business. <laughs> yeah. I'm planning on actually making money. Like that sounds so weird, but you know, cause people that have like millions of followers, it's like this idea they've monetized. Yeah, a long you've time never ago. monetized. It's like crazy. You're sitting here being like, actually, I think I probably should be trying <laughs> to support a business from this. I always saw social media more as like a hobby yeah. in the sense of, I really enjoy making videos. So out of all my creator friends, I would say like 95% of them don't really love the videos they make. What, what do you think about the creators you've met? Oh, absolutely. Right before even starting the pod, we talked about a friend who was making one type of content and hated it and decided to like totally change it up because she was just miserable. At the end of the day, this is a job for most people, right? Yeah. So you don't have to be vulnerable at work. It, I choose to be vulnerable in this space, but if you are just showing up for a paycheck, making money as a creator, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. However, most people that are doing it are doing it to use this opportunity to get somewhere else. Like a lot of people are going into acting. A lot of people are, you know, selling products, selling courses. They're using it to like their own financial benefit. Um, and for me, I always saw content as like just a way to survive. So it is my financial benefit, but not as like a security blanket, more just like, I just want to, you know, be able to do things that are interesting in my life. It's just a reflection of your life. It just also happens to help fund your life. I, I try to describe my videos as an accurate representation of the human experience. What do you mean by that? I think there is a lot, there isn't like that much of a filter on what I'm putting online. Yeah. It's mostly just whether it's a good day or a bad day or things that I'm interested in, like you're going to get at least like the most accurate version of 
a typical human experience that you can get. Like this online. is Philip. This is you. But I also realized that my online personality is such a small percentage of who I am. Mm. Like I am much more like we are very dynamic creatures. So we cannot put our entire personality multitudes. Yeah. A podcast is really cool because you get to hear a lot longer, like an hour of, you know, my thoughts, which are, I know so jumbled. So I apologize. But, um, on TikTok, it's like a little bit more of a, Hey, plus on TikTok, it's you editing. It's your POV on yourself. So I can kind of script the narrative just a little bit, or a lot bit, honestly. I choose yeah. what goes online. And that's why I try to be vulnerable. But hiring my first friend, you know. Who's sitting in the background <laughs> behind us right now, Ponce. My best friend, I, I hired him. And now we travel the world together. And I kind of joke sometimes that it's mostly because I was so lonely that I'm paying someone to travel the world with me. Aww. But like, let's touch on that a bit. Because you shared, there's always this deep fear of hey, my friends will grow tired of me, so I'll leave first. Ponce is your friend, but you are paying him to travel the yeah. world with you as well. And like you have a genuine friendship shared around a lot on like big life realizations, not wanting to live this same corporate life and doing something different. And he's also a member of Company Philip now. For people that are trying to run a company or a business, it is so much pressure to have someone on your payroll. Like I cannot even fathom having like five people because you know, they say that a creator business is an upside down pyramid. Right. And if I'm at the top, I'm at the top of this pyramid or the, the point of this pyramid and I stop working, this man doesn't eat, you know, no one eats in this business. And that is just so much freaking pressure and I am trying to get used to it and trying to hire on people and just keep my burn so low that I don't feel like I can give people, you know, everything they need. But man, like, I don't know how people do it. I don't know how people run businesses. It's so scary. It's like, on the one hand, money gives you freedom. On the other hand, money comes from business. Growing the business means scaling. Scaling means bringing on people. Bring on people means responsibilities and obligations of other people on you. It kind of feels so odd, but it feels like there's a point where I have so much freedom in the world and just bringing my best friend on, bringing Ponce on, it feels like I've actually lost a little bit of freedom. But yeah, I think that's okay because just kind of like a relationship, like any romantic relationship you you know try to, to get yourself into, you sacrifice a little bit of freedom, but for so many other things, like, you know, he's scared, he's security for me. He's, you know, emotional security too. Uh, he's a pretty big guy. So, you know, he can protect me. He's tall. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, for the most part, like he brings so much, just like someone to talk to someone to, you know, share these experiences with, because I will say that traveling the world by yourself and going to experience oh all these cool things is really cool. But when you go back home, you have no one to share these experiences with. Like your friends will understand like these crazy things that you're doing in Poland, the TikToks, but, the highlights, but they'll never like, you know, really, you don't have anyone to truly bask and share in these experiences. With. The guy who's literally sitting out when it is super hot and shitty weather and you're trying to hitchhike and catch a car and you're sitting there for hours. It's like, he's there with you. I, we really need to change the way we make videos because some of these experiences we're doing, we're just like, we just think that it's going to be cool. Like, we didn't plan for it to be video. We're just like, all right, this is going to be something cool that we really enjoy. And then later we're like, how do we turn this into a video? Well, it's actually very real that like a lot of your videos are you just sitting around. <laughs> it's like, that's how it is. And there is, to your point on the trade off, there's beauty in commitment. Like there is something meaningful about deciding, oh, like I am going to commit to you in this infinity of possibilities and people. You are the best for me. And I am the best for you because we are choosing to say that to each other, even through the moments of just sitting around with nothing to do. I think that one thing I chase a lot is novelty because obviously yeah. I'm in a new place all the time. And new people, new things. Um, one of these days, I'm probably going to get to a point where that's not going to happen anymore. And that is an, a beautiful thing itself that I'm really excited for is, you know, just learning to exist without novelty. You almost have this aspiration of settling down. You've mentioned wanting to sign a lease for a year like building a company with people that you work with consistently. What about from a personal relationships POV? Oh, well, there's like so many things about this. First, I want to say that 
the other day I was in my apartment in Manila that I rented for one month and I was folding my laundry. And that was one of the coolest things in my life. Cause normally we wash our clothes in the sink with like, you know, the soap from wherever you are. Yeah. Like if we're in like a bathroom, like I've been in so many public bathrooms, just like washing my clothes, (laughs) which I know sounds ridiculous. You're an expert at this. (laughs) And we only have like, I think like the last trip, I only had four t-shirts and three shorts Wow. and like one hoodie and one sweatpants. So I didn't really have that many clothes. Um, I watched this movie, everything, everywhere Everywhere at once. once. And one of the lines, you rent a laundry mat, by the way. Yeah. One of the lines that made me cry was like, in a different life, I would just like to grow old and do laundry or do taxes with you. Do laundry and, and taxes. taxes with you. And that, I was like, that is my dream is I, I've been single for seven years. Like, do you know what it's like to be single for seven years? It, you just worry about, will someone actually like me if I get into the open market? You know, I mean, I am in the open market and that's the but scary you've, thing. You've seen, the but scary you've, thing. you've seen and been with so many people. Yeah, but it's so different because like there's one... I met this, for example, I met this amazing girl in Japan and the way we met is like a movie. I was sitting next to her in the subway and my friend Sean Rizwan makes these TikToks where he asks people what song you're listening to. Yeah. And I simply just looked at her and I was like, what song are you listening to? And she's like, Nani? And I was like, music. And she shows me her phone and she's listening to Rex Orange County. And I'm like, I'm from Orange County. So I'm like using Google Translate to tell her, talk to her. I asked her to go out with me that night and she said, yes, we can't even speak the same language. That's wild. Thank goodness my friends that we met all speak Japanese. So that was really convenient, but we ended up really liking each other. And, but I was there for one month. So after that month, she like sent me a message. This is, this broke my heart. She sent me a message maybe a few months ago saying, it just occurred to my mind that there will be a day that you no longer think of me. And I don't even know if I'll realize it. I didn't know what to say to that, but I said, (laughs) I said, wow, your English has gone so good. Just too much emotional processing for you. I didn't know what to say, honestly, because I haven't dated in so long, like a real relationship. And it's so easy to have like fun little one month flings, but like a commitment to someone more than like a month or two, that's like, that's amazing that people can, you know, join in that union together, but it is really scary for me. I think it's the same around a month is long enough to see the best in each other, but not always the boring parts are the worst. And that's the thing is people meet me and it's really exciting. They're like, oh, this guy's like traveling the world. He's doing these really cool things, like trying to help people sometimes and just making cool videos sometimes and going on adventures. And so on the outside, what you're perceiving is like, oh, this is like Like really special. the coolest guy in the world. Exactly. But I'm not the coolest guy in the world. I'm just a very normal guy with a lot of problems. And I I have so many flaws, but because it's only a month, you don't really see those flaws. So I'm... I just leave before they find them out. <laughs> and the concept around in another world, I would have loved just to be doing laundry and taxes with you. It's because like, I think laundry and taxes might be two of the most boring things in human existence. And so to do them together with someone means we've been around long enough that the default state is to do things together, even if they're super boring and not fun, because why wouldn't we do it together? My favorite thing in the world is whenever I get comfortable enough with someone that I just do errands with them. So like, oh, yeah. so groceries. My, getting groceries or like if a friend has to go to the post office, I'm like, I'll come with. And they're like, why would you waste your time doing that? I'm like, I don't know. I, my, my yeah. life isn't about efficiency okay, at all. It's like the little rhythms of daily life in a way, like that's what you crave, but are also scared of getting to a point where you have that default assumption you'll be there. Cause what if they don't like me? I get it too. Like, I think for me, for a long time, I had the same experience with friendships where I'd be like, specifically like people I would meet like through a thing, like at work, for example, I'd be like, you know, for a month, I can be the coolest guy ever. But then after a month, that's hitting the tolerance point of me being able to repress all the like intrusive OCD anxieties and thoughts Mm. that I have where then I'm like, okay, a month is too long. Now you're going to see me cranky. 
I feel like you're a very beautiful mind. Thank you. But on the other side, I feel like if I was a beautiful mind, I would be so scared to let people in to whatever's going on up here. You mentioned your content, your channel is like the human existence of Philip. As I mentioned, I went through almost every single TikTok you've made last night. I, I feel bad for you right now. <laughs> no, they were, they were, it was amazing. It was like, you know, the expression like life flashes before your eyes, that, yeah. like when you're about to pass. Like I got the weirdest like life, like flashing before my eyes, but it was like, it was your life because they're TikToks. This is the strangest thing to, I've been in some situations where I almost died, obviously. Yeah. And like my life flashed before my eyes, but like in a mixture of my memories and a mixture of my TikToks. TikToks. Yeah. <laughs> like it was so weird. I remember you right after the Ukraine explosion calling your, your friend Anya. Like from what I remember what you told me last year, this is like, it's a good friend. It's like a recent friend that you had made. And it's almost just like, hey, like I might die. I nearly died. And she's just like, what the f***? Why are you there? Like, yeah, it's, I think it's even tougher because she's Ukrainian, you know, and she's yeah. lost people in this war. I don't know how to explain it, but I thought that the more people I lost in my life, the more, the easier it would get. I really thought that, you know, as I started to have more people die in my life, I would kind of just be used to it. But it's gotten to a point where it's breaking me down even more. Like, I feel like every single person I lose is just like a crack in my armor, another crack in my armor. And I feel so sensitive to it now. Like, I really don't think I could lose another person this next year. Yeah. So it's just more trauma. I guess that's another thing is like, I was talking to my therapist about this too. Yeah. What did your therapist say? She said like another reason why you probably disassociate is because you just keep losing people. And so you just leave and that way just that loss doesn't feel as heavy. Like I rarely have ever yeah. had DMs where people are telling me like, I wish I had your life. Usually the comments are, oh my God, your life is so amazing. I could never do that. I remember you shared like your father's dream. Like the dream was always two things. One was like UCLA and second was to live a life adventure and travel because by the time he reached that place, he... He didn't get. It. He was too old. He was too tired. He was too sick, from you know someone who was a war refugee to becoming a god professor at Irvine. My dad is in the UCR like, Hall of Fame. Like, How crazy is that? That is that is insane. Like the work you put in, and like, I think two questions. One, the first one is like, do you feel like you've now honored that dream? I think. Um, I mean, I'm really lucky that my dad, even though those were his dreams, like he didn't care too much about what I was doing. Like, mm. truly, his end goal was just be happy. What about your mom? Like, what's her, for a long time, it was that more conventional life. What's her dream for you now? Now that you've, like, you're, you've described her now as, like, your best friend, right? You've shared talking to her on the phone, not always sharing where you physically were. I remember you didn't tell her you were in Ukraine. No way. No way. Now, today, when you think about your relationship with her, like, what's her dream for you? Does she have one? I think some context between my mom's relationship and I, like... My mom is a war refugee. So because of that, she had a much more violent upbringing. Yeah. Um, also, she's from Vietnam and it's just a lot different, you know, how people interact like there. Beating your kids, which I know beating, you experienced, like that's more the norm. I'd say I love my mom, but yeah. probably from ages six to like 12, I was beat 40% of the days of my existence. And I, I don't want to put it all on my mom because I was also just doing some heinous things. Like I was the kid in Walmart that would just grab stuff and throw them into other aisles. Like, I don't know why. It's a cycle that feeds on itself because she sees something, she acts on it in the way that she's been taught. That creates her. You're acting out in the only ways you know how. I was definitely not the easiest kid to raise. And so, yeah, my mom and I, we just didn't have a relationship. And to be honest, like, oh, I had this notebook that every time my mom would beat me, I would carve into it. Like, I hate my mom. And it got to the point where this is a five-star notebook, five-subject notebook, and I carved it all the way from the first page all the way to the back page. And so I hid this notebook underneath my desk because I was just kind of ashamed of it. You know, I was ashamed of the beatings. I was ashamed of how I reacted to it because as a kid, you're just supposed to take it. You know, you're supposed to be better else the next time. Do? I was ashamed of hating my mom because that's... Yeah, the, the, you're taught to respect your elders in our culture. So 
I didn't talk to my mom for years. Like, or maybe we'd have like every now and then a few <sighs> phrases back and forth, say hi to each other. But it felt like if she disappeared, I wouldn't have cared. And more recently, you know, she came back. I came back into her life and we fixed ourselves so much. And her dream for me was to be rich. It was always to be wealthy and that way I can take care of her, <laughs> which <laughs> I think is very valid because yeah. she grew up as a refugee. You know, she just, she needs Yeah, it's a way stability. how you express love. It's like taking care of Exactly. But more recently, I can't believe how much she's changed. And this has made me think that no matter how old you are, you still can change because yeah. my mom, she like, used to kind of be like, you know, a little bit prejudiced to people, kind of judge them on how they look. Now she's not like that. She tries to give everyone an opportunity. And she told me the other day, she's like, I just want you to be happy. And that blew wow. my freaking mind. Like, what? She's okay with me not making that much money. Like, she knows about my finances. She knows that I, I can't live in America based on how much I make currently. And she's okay with that. She just thinks that what I'm doing is really cool now. What a crazy, like, for your mom to say, like, I just want you to be happy is like saying, I accept you as you are, yeah. which is like, I mean, Asian man, that's, 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 uh, that's, that's unheard of. like wild. I feel very, very blessed. And I feel really, I feel a lot for what she's been through. But aside from, you know, her escaping her country, yeah. like, my mom, when she first came to America, she came to Colorado. She's made this joke. It was so funny. She's like, I had never seen snow before. I'd only read about it in textbooks. So like that was horrible for her. Her first boyfriend died. Her, you know, her second boyfriend cheated on her. She had to bring her entire family from Vietnam over. Like such yeah. a tough life. And then finally, like she starts to get stability. She starts to do well. Her husband's doing well. Her, her husband passes away. And then she tries to get remarried. And that in Divorce. itself is really difficult in the Asian community. Like it's like you went through a failed marriage already. Second marriage fails. And she, both the kids aren't talking to her. And she's now she's in this reality of like everyone in my mom's life has left her. And I think that created so much change in her life where she's just, she yeah. tries her best to just actually enjoy her life now. I, um, like I said, I, I saw my mom about a month ago. Yeah. I hadn't seen her since before 2020. She lives in New Jersey. It's not that far away. <laughs> and I actually didn't see my dad. Um, so I haven't seen my dad for over four years now. Wow. Yeah. And it's so f weird. Like, I obviously, like, am comfortable in all my decisions, but, like, I don't know, just thinking about it, I just feel sad. Like, I think the reason why I don't visit is because there's just so much emotional energy tied into, like you said, you don't like being here in Orange County because it reminds you of growing up in cases that weren't for great, sure. like ages 6 to 12. I think it's similar for me. Like, when I'm home, I, like, have to, I think, remember things that I don't want to. And, of like... Course. Of course, it's just running away because like, you know, like they say like, oh, you know, do you remember what you're doing when you're one year old? Guess what? You probably don't. But guess what? You unconsciously remember. Like it's probably shaping you in ways mm -hmm. that you don't consciously recall. And so I'm like, it's all still there. Just because I'm not home doesn't mean I don't remember everything. You know, you share in your con like your mom beat you and you share that right now. I haven't thought about this for a while. I'm like, like there's only one time like, uh, you know, my mom whipped me, right? Because like in kindergarten, there's like this three strike system where like if you talk too much you get in trouble and like I talked too much one day and I came home and I was like oh like there's like green light yellow light red light I'm like I got a yellow light and yeah I remember just like it's so funny how distinctly you remember these things like it only happened once so and she's very sorry like you know it was an ongoing thing but like I just remember like literally the house we grew up in just like standing there in the corner and just like Memorizing like the topography of the wall. Yeah. Because, you know, it's just staring at it. I think it's, you know, one of the hardest things about getting beat, I feel like, is obviously the pain you're going through, but I feel like a lot of the times 
for the person dishing out that pain, right. they are unable to remember or they don't want to remember themselves doing something so horrible. Right. So because of that, I think one of the hardest things was knowing that my mom didn't remember beating me. Right. And it adds like, wow, like you are the pain point to some of the hardest things I've ever been through. And yet you don't remember that, but it makes sense though. Cause like, that's not the most traumatic moments of her life. Right. Uh, the most traumatic moments of her life are being beat herself in a refugee camp. Right. And then it's like this really weird thing where I'm like, yeah, I, you know, my parents, I'm sure went through something. I'm like, what does my thing matter? You know, like, yeah, it's like she didn't remember because she's been through so much, but like, doesn't change the fact you remember. And it's tough because there is this idea that like your pain is valid. Like you totally. obviously got very emotional just recounting that. It's like so weird because I don't think about it, you know? It's like, I'm not, I didn't expect that, you know? But sometimes you just talk about things and like it just triggers something. Of course. Yeah. I always think like in a, a little bit lighter way, like it's just so interesting how our minds work because even as a kid, like everything about adult supervision when you're a kid your parents will always ask you hey make sure you or they'll they'll always tell you make sure you bring a sweater outside it's cold and right. you're always just upset you're like fine whatever yeah yeah but even when i'm older the same sentiment like my mom will be like hey make sure you bring a sweater and i'm like trying my best not to get upset for some reason because it just reminds me of me oh, being small again totally oh it's the same like when your mom's like, oh, like, make sure to do this. I'm like, oh, you're trying to help me, but I don't, I don't want it because it just reminds me. Of, of them making you feel small. Oh, yeah. Of like growing up. And it's so weird because my friends will say the exact same thing. Like my friend Nick will be like, hey, it's cold outside. Make sure you bring a sweater. And I'm like, that is so thoughtful. But it's just because it comes from a different lens of how you That's view so, the situation. I've never thought about that, but it's so true. Like... My dad still tells me my taxes sometimes. It's actually the only thing I ever communicate with him ever. It's mm -hmm. like taxes. And like, he like texts me and I'll just get so frustrated and annoyed. Like, even though it's so objectively minor, if anyone yeah. else texted me, I'd be like, yeah, sure. Like, I just get so upset because I guess it just reminds me like him asking me to do things. And it's so interesting because most of the time they're helping you oh, with your no, taxes. He's literally helping me. It's like bizarre. Like the emotional, it's just like, you know. What I've realized in my 20s doing therapy is yeah. it is essentially just unraveling the things that happened in my childhood that I might have consciously forgot or maybe I just don't think right. of all the time. And now it's like unraveling them and understanding how these things play a part of my life today. What do you feel like are big realizations you've had this past year from that on that note of like unconscious things to unravel and how they affect you? I did not realize that I am scared of commitment so much, <laughs> which I'm pretty sure every single person that watches my videos could have. <laughs> oh yeah. That. Dude, your comments are literally people feel like Philip do therapy. Yeah. Even, even aside from like the, the family trauma, like I had a lot of, I would say sexual trauma growing up. Yeah. And I don't want to get too deep into it right now, but yeah, it plays a role in how I am today. Yeah. And it's something that I honestly forgot for a lot of, honestly, what happened was oh someone, a woman was telling me about how she was sexually assaulted and it brought me back to this smaller version of me and something that happened in my childhood that I totally forgot. I think seeing how that's played a role in my sex life nowadays is really interesting. Like it almost feels like sometimes I fetishize like things that remind me of that, which is so odd. Like it's my trauma and yeah, like I think the mind works in really odd ways. Yeah. So I'm like trying my best to, you know, navigate this new landscape of why I enjoy some things and why I don't. And then on top of like, you know, the, how much is out there and yeah. how you're seeing what sex should be like. Totally. I don't, I don't know. Like I'm trying to figure everything out myself and I didn't realize, I didn't realize how much trauma I had until like the first session with my therapist. And she said to me towards the end, like, wow, you've been through a lot of trauma. And I literally responded, that doesn't sound very professional to say. <laughs> and then after that, she asked about my family and I told her my dad passed and she's like, Oh my God, your dad passed as well. And I'm like, is this a lot more than any normal person has been through? I feel like 
we're all losing people, but I guess I have many more experiences because I'm traveling and I'm meeting so many more people. And so because of that, my sphere of influence is much yeah. wider. It's just normal that like... It's so broad. I remember, um, you know, I, I started therapy properly like four years ago. I've had the same therapist now for four years. But I, I tried here and then before. And I remember one of the reasons I tried a therapist like years ago, like much longer ago. And I didn't stick with her because I remember like... First of all, to your point, like, yeah, memory is weird, man. Like you said, like you didn't remember some of the trauma you went through, but then like you hadn't thought about it, but clearly your body remembers, clearly your mind remembers. Or like right now, that was like, that was like a really weird experience for me. I'm like, I haven't thought about that for like a while, but like even just thinking about it, I'm like, why am I crying? This is weird. Like, huh? You know, mm-hmm. you're just like, huh? It's like, I'm, I'm going to go think about that later. Like weird. But like, I remember like with that therapist, like talking with her and then now I feel even worse. Like, <laughs> like, you're literally like a trained medical professional and you're crying. Like now I just yeah. feel sh- yeah. like I just suck. And so the, when I, when I properly started doing therapy, I made sure like in this really weird way, I was like, any therapist I see, like I can't be friends with them. I don't want you to be friends with me because I also don't want to feel the emotional guilt of like, Oh my God, now you're crying. Like, fuck, like I made you cry. Like I, I'm like, we're yeah. going to like, I'm going to refer to you as doctor even four years. And I don't even refer to her as a name. Cause I, I need that level of depersonalization. And I'm like, because like I, I don't want it to get too personal. I like if my therapist is crying, then I'm just like, yo, like I can't do this. She's, I, I feel like my therapist is pretty emotionally invested in my life oh. now. And how does that feel? You know, I never thought about it until right now. But she seems genuinely so excited to talk to me because like <laughs> I'm I'm FaceTiming her. I'm like I'm video calling yeah, my therapist virtual, yeah. from new countries every single month. <laughs> so yeah. she's like seeing me in a new background, and she's like, "Where are you now?" <sighs> Um, I will say, I think therapy saved my life. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I don't know if I could exist in this current phase of my life without <sighs> therapy. And yeah, I think in the last year, the decisions I've made, not just from therapy, but also just life experiences is cutting out people that I feel like are just not bad, but just don't, can't invest their time into me. <sighs> like I really try to spend all my time communicating with my inner circle and building and strengthening those relationships. Yeah. It's not that these other people are bad. It's just they're busy or they have other things to do. And it's, it's hard, you know, for me to keep investing my time. Yeah. It feels one-sided sometimes, you know? Yeah, man. I'm sensing like there's so much decided optimism. It's like, you know, nothing's changed from like a, you still have gone through the same things. You're still the same person. The same things are still happening. It's just like, the way you're processing it and handling it and describing it to me is really different. I'm like watching all these cat videos. I rescued, I fostered these cats in Cambodia, basically. They were like in the trash bin. What are their names? Amakana Kun. (laughs) And again, I remember a fox too in Poland. I did rescue that fox, um, which is weird because I hated animals growing up. I hated animals growing up. Like my mom like does not, animals at all so for me i grew up with that same hatred and as i've gone older i realized people like animals and i just always had a healthy respect for them like that's a dog you can be over there dude that's so different though from like i respect the fact that you were a dog to like taking care of and now i love animals Why? what happened there's this like quote i saw about a poem from a spider's perspective and the line is that like I think it's something that really connected to something I always said when I was younger. Well, I think the line was like, my only crime was being seen. And that's why someone wants to kill the spider. And mm. I felt like my childhood growing up, like I always kept saying like, my only crime was purely existing. And it felt like, you know, me just mm. being there, like I was getting beat or I was being shunned, being spat at, called these racial slurs. I really connected with that quote and I realized that all these living animals, they're just trying to survive. It's insane to me that like, because like you've made videos about the racism you've experienced, right? Like a guy kicking over your camera, like people coming up and like hitting you in the head. You would be shocked how much when you travel, people just yell at you Jackie Chan. I think because when 
most people travel, they go to major cities where there's diversity. Right. But because I live in a van traveling through you're Europe, going everywhere. I go to these small places where they've never seen an Asian person before. They don't have that much experience with Asian people. Yeah, you're Jackie Chan of them. So I'm Jackie Chan of them. It's kind of interesting because in these countries, it just seems like they're trying to crack a joke. Right. They're not even necessarily angry or pissed or malignant. Yeah. Well, except the guy that punched me. Well, you know, that's different. That or, actually, or the guy that kicked in your camera. Yeah. In America, I feel like I go through so few racist experiences. Like, I've been to every state, so it's not like me just going to, like, California and New York. <laughs> You're like, in Orange County, <laughs> Los Angeles. <laughs> There's, like, so many Asian people. Like, yeah, it feels yeah. like with the majority sometimes. But when I'm traveling around America, if I do experience a racist experience, it kind of feels like hatred almost. Because it has to be so much more intentional. Yeah, because, like, for us, like, in Europe, it's just like, oh, this is not something... It's we, just ignorance. Yeah. But in America, like... I feel like everyone's like really scared of being racist because it's all over the news. Right. Like they're afraid so of they're being racist. They're, they're like, they really, they really hate you. Oh yeah. It's intentional racism. So like when people have been racist to me in America, I'm like actually scared for my life. That, to be fair, I've only been scared of my life one time because this guy was following me in Los Angeles. Oh, that's pretty fucking scary. <laughs> he had like a mask on I, I, I too. don't think you need to say to be fair. I think you'd be like, yeah. We're walking back to my car at like three in the morning and you know, we're walking out of my car into my friend's apartment at three in the morning and this guy's walking behind us. And I'm like, oh, let's just let him pass. We let him pass. Then he starts walking. Uh, we start walking. He lets us pass, oh. stares me in the eye. And then we get to this cul-de-sac. And he's like so walking around us, circling us now. And I'm like, Damn, this is like, Asian hate crimes are happening at this point. This guy is circling around us and I'm calling my best friend, or one of my closest friends, Andrew. And I'm like, Andrew, please come outside. This guy is circling us. God. Andrew's like a huge guy, runs outside and sees us, joins this circle where we're all just circling each other, like scared for our lives. And then we run into the house and he slams the door. And I just never, I've been traveling the world for so long. I've never had an experience like that. Like I truly was, that was like the first time. And this is what, in New York? In LA. In LA. The first time. I've been scared for my life in America. Like, which I know is crazy because I know there's like so many like shootings and such, but yeah. for me, I haven't experienced that. That was my yeah. first time experiencing something so. So yeah, yeah when, when I thought back to you last year, like I remember you just being like really sad and traumatized by Ukraine, running around in Crocs or flip flops or whatever. And like remembering the last thing was like, I don't know if I'll ever see you again. And like now I'm going to walk away and be like, like Philip is getting healthy. <laughs> what are you most excited about like a year from now in a dream when we catch up? Hopefully we'll catch up again, not like a whole year, mm -hmm. but say it is a year. Like where do you want to be? Like I want mm -hmm. more people to work with because it's super lonely being a creator. Yeah. I've just been making videos in my bedroom or in someone's couch or in my van alone for so many years I would like to have someone, like a team to work with. I would really like to have a girlfriend. <laughs> Nine years single. It's seven, seven years. Seven years single. Next year will be eight. I don't know if that's the right mentality to have. Like, I don't know if it's right to say I want to have a girlfriend. I don't think it's wrong to say you're ready more for commitment. What about yourself? Like, how do you want, how do you want to be feeling? One of the weirdest things about my life is that I have kind of come to this conclusion that... I kind of have everything I've ever wanted for the most part. Mm. And at the age of 27, like I just have the financial flexibility to travel. Um, you know, maybe not well, I'm definitely not business class ever, but at this point just have that flexibility. And I'm lucky to have a passport that lets me go to many places. Yeah. But for some reason, I feel like I'm still like deep down, like struggling a lot with just existing. I don't know how to explain it. Like my day to day, I just, have a lot of problems that come up but despite that i feel pretty positive about it so if i could just keep that mentality and be able to stay grounded and mm. you know also feel like i don't need all the money in the world just slightly more than now because right now i just signed with management thank you thank you undercurrent <laughs> and signing with management they asked me what do you want a year from now like what are your goals and i said I want to be making like enough money that he doesn't have to sleep on the couch anymore or I don't have to sleep on well, the couch. What's that number for you? Like It's $7,000 a month. So it's $84,000 a year. Yeah. I don't think that's unreasonable, especially for myself. I mean, yeah. I know that I can make that, yeah. but like it's like a slow process, right? Where 
I don't want to just start churning out content. I like this number, I think I've calculated as enough for us to both get Airbnbs wherever we want, where we can both stay in our own bedroom and be able to invest back in the videos. Because mm. since he's come on, I haven't been able to invest back in the videos because all the extra money hey, I make, you want to pay it's, it's going to pay his bills, right? Or pay, yeah. you know, to, for him to live. So I thought that $84,000 a year is enough for us to travel almost anywhere in the world, still be able to make the videos we love, invest in bigger projects, and be able to get by. Because before this year, you were making less than like, if I recall correctly, like less than like 50,000. Like, like 30. <laughs> like $30,000 <laughs> yeah. a year. You were making $30,000 a year with millions of followers. I think last year I made like forty. Four forty-five. $44,000. Yeah, it's been it's pretty... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like people I think are always scared to ask me about my, how much money I make. And I'm like so easy about it because I make so little. Like it's like... <laughs> oh yeah, you're like, I'm very comfortable sharing this. And no, I get it. It's like your goal is you're living the life you want to live. Sure, there's every day there's that makes it hard, but you're getting through it and you just want a little bit more. Right now, like we go out to eat and I can't even afford anything because we're in LA. Like I know that right now, forty thousand dollars a year doesn't sound that bad, but it's for two people in Los Angeles or New okay, York City. Okay, so essentially living on twenty thousand dollars a year. <laughs> it's not easy, right? It's hard. That's so hard. And I mean, that's why we live in Asia because it's so much cheaper. Yeah. But for the most part, even in Asia, we still don't go to like nice restaurants. Right. Like, we go get street food. Um, but for the most part, anytime we do eat out with people, we always pay because us making $20,000 each a year is still way more they can make right. in Asia. So for us, like, I guess that's the goal is like $42,000 each in Asia. That's yeah, enough. That's, that's, a, year. that's enough to exist very well and be able to invest back in the videos. Philip, thank you so much for making time. <laughs> Hopefully one year from now, we'll see the update pod. This man will be living on $42,000 a year. We will, we will get him there. Yeah, I mean, I know that this podcast, there's some, been some very impressive people on. And yet you also are very impressive. Maybe, I guess another goal is a year from now, you'll see yourself the way I see it, Philip. I'm honored. Thank, Thank you for you making so much. time. Oh, yeah, give me a hug. <laughs>